on and up to more complicated things, what happens now in the baroclinic fluid? So now we have two layers, two layers, both of which are moving. And so in layer one and in layer two, we have to define the potential vorticity, right? And so, yeah, as I said before, we can define it in terms of vertical gradients of the stream function. So you discretize this term in the equation and you get these terms where it depends just on the difference between the stream function between the two layers. So Q1 depends on both layers and so does Q2. Right? We have two coupled equations for the conservation of potential vorticity. Now I've, I've dropped the background flow in this example just to keep things simple. It doesn't make much difference to our understanding. And uh, the problem now is to solve this, these two equations. And you see, we can't solve these two equations independently because they're coupled. So we need to decouple them, right? So we need to think in terms of new variables, which will give us two independent equations. Right? So this is very much the same thing that we were doing in the first lecture where we were coupling things into, we were decoupling things into vertical modes. And it's quite simple in this case. Even with different layer thicknesses, we can um, define what we call the barotropic mode, psi bar, which is a weighted sum of the stream function by the layer thicknesses. You can also express it in terms of the Rossby radius. And the baroclinic mode, which is just the difference between the two layers. Right? So if we do a substitution and we say we write, rewrite these two equations, not in terms of psi 1 and psi 2, but just in terms of psi bar and psi hat, we get these two equations, right? The equation for the barotropic mode, which looks quite naturally like the barotropic vorticity equation, right? and an equation for the baroclinic mode, which, in, which includes this extra stretching term with the Vosby radius in it. Okay? So these two modes are associated with these two dispersion relations, the first of which um, depending on the shape of the wave, we'll have variable um, dispersion relation between this extreme and something where you can have some non-dispersive barotropic waves. And the baroclinic mode with this Rossby radius term in the denominator will always give you some almost non-dispersive Rossby waves for the long Rossby waves there. Okay? So that's our third case, but it's not the end because... We're going to move on now to the vertically, vertically continuous problem, right? So what if we try to solve with this full expression for the potential vorticity with this continuously variable stream function, so the vertical gradient of the horizontal stream function here in this term. So this is the Buzinesque um, expression of quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity, right? And we have a boundary condition which is still equivalent to no vertical velocity at the top or at the bottom. And we will look for wave solutions now, um, again, with this uh, complex exponential. But now we have to acknowledge that our coefficients might be dependent on the vertical, okay? So before we had two modes because we had two layers. Now we've got something vertically continuous. So we have functions of z, okay? So what do they look like? Well, the trouble is that if you take this expression and you substitute it into here, what are you going to get? You're not going to get a simple algebraic expression. You'll get a differential equation for this coefficient, which is a function of z. It's a differential equation in z for this coefficient. So then you'll still have to solve that, right? So to simplify things, we'll make what we call this separable um, dependence assumption where we say that this term here can be represented as a linear term in the stream function. Okay? So this equation then will give us the structures that we have in the vertical and then this equation will give us the dispersion relation for the Rossby wave. If we just substitute that in here. Okay? First of all, this equation, these are eigenfunctions in the vertical. And that's very simple. They're just cosine functions. The solutions to this equation are just these cosine functions. The first one is, is this one, which is just a half a wave. Okay? Um, the second one, so that's the first 
mode. The second mode is a full wave in the vertical. This is the third mode, one and a half waves in the vertical. Okay, so these are our modes, n equals one, two, three, all right? And for each mode, we'll have a different value of gamma, okay? And this is our, this is our dispersion relation. Omega is minus beta L over k squared. K squared is just L squared plus M squared, okay? Plus gamma, so it's a baroclinic Rossby wave dispersion relation. Plus gamma is variable, so for each different mode, for each different vertical structure, we have a different Rossby wave with different properties, so it'll have a different phase speed, for example, depending on this, on this, um, this thing, gamma, which gamma is related to the vertical wave number, so you can define it that way. So you can say gamma is the square of the vertical wave number. Remember, wave number is 2 pi over wavelength, so for n equals 2, for example, this is 2 pi over the depth. And so you can express it like that, and for, for each different mode, you'll have a different phase speed, all right? And the phase speed of the Rossby waves is given by omega over L, okay? You can also express um, this vertical wave number in terms of Cn, which is not the Rossby wave speed, it's the gravity wave speed, okay? N over K, okay? So that, we're going to use that in a minute. Right. These dashed lines, the assumption I made here was that the stratification was constant, okay? That doesn't vary with depth. You can go to a more realistic description, which is non is an S square. N squared is a function of Z, and if you do that, you can have the same approach to finding the vertical modes, but you'll find they won't be simple uh, cosine functions. They will depend on this variable stratification, and most of the variation will be squeezed into the thermocline layer where most of the stratification is. Okay, so you, realistically, for oceanographers, they, they talk about these modes which are compressed into the thermocline region here. So this blue one, this, uh, this second mode here, and then this third mode. You can see the peak of the third mode is much higher. So that's, you know, that's important for you to be exposed to that. That's how oceanographers think. They think about vertical modes. And you see there are very good reasons for thinking about vertical modes because it allows you to separate the behavior of Rossby waves uh, and you can separately talk about their different dispersion relations, their different phase speeds. Rossby waves, we talk about them propagating horizontally, right? But they have a vertical component to their propagation as well. Even though their uh, restoring force, if you like, is in the horizontal, uh, if they are out of phase in uh, different layers, then they can effectively propagate with a vertical component to their propagation. So we can solve for that by, well, just write this vertical wave number here as n over c. Uh, c is the gravity wave phase speed for the mode in question. Okay, and here's the dispersion relation. Omega, again, omega is beta L over K squared, which is the horizontal wave number, plus KV squared times this coefficient. And let's assume that we're talking about very long waves, horizontal waves which are very long. So this K squared is small compared to this term here. And you can approximate this like this, right? Which you can write like this. Okay. And then you can then say, well, what's the... Uh, What's the group speed for this Rossby wave in the horizontal and in the vertical? And the group speed is d omega by dl in the zonal direction, and it's d omega by dkv in the vertical direction. See, d omega by dl is very straightforward. d omega by dkv is also pretty straightforward. And then if you look at the ratio between the two group speeds, that will give you the slope at which the energy will propagate. And you can actually trace the direction of propagation of perturbation. So here is a picture of a, a ray which has been traced showing the, per, the, the propagation of a perturbation to the thermocline depth, giving evidence, this is observational evidence, of vertically propagating Rossby waves. Right, observations, carry on with observations. Here are some observations which show some horizontal propagation. So this is altimeter data, this is from a satellite altimeter, where they've been looking at the sea level, and these are perturbations of the sea level over about five years, between 93 and 98, so it's quite old, this, this picture. 
And so these are the ocean basins. So this is time and this is longitude at a certain range of latitudes, somewhere near the equator. So this is the Pacific Ocean. This is America. This is the Atlantic. This is Africa. And this is the Indian Ocean. I think that stripe there is Madagascar. Uh, and then maritime continent and then back into the Pacific. Okay. So what do we see? We see these diagonal stripes and they you can see that if it's sloping this way then as time progresses up the screen it's propagating westwards and it takes about five years to get across the Pacific what we're looking at here is a perturbation to the sea level now that could be just an external Rossby wave which would propagate very fast or it could be the adjustment of the sea level to a perturbation on the thermocline, which would be a baroclinic Rossby wave, which would go much slower. And that's almost certainly what it is, because the, the barotropic wave would go much too fast to be picked up by this altimeter's time resolution. So this looks like the trace of a baroclinic Rossby wave traversing the Pacific in a few years, although it's not entirely sure whether that's exactly what it is, or whether it's also to do with nonlinear uh, phenomena like eddies traveling across as well.